First, though, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to our regular conservative commentator comes in uh, every Well, I say comes in. He's on the radio every week, but he's actually come in. Uh, so what a pleasure to meet in person, Connor Tomlinson. Evening, Connor. Evening, Kevin. I'm slowly infiltrating your life more and more. Yeah, exactly. I was getting a bit disconcerting, I must say. Uh, is that the stalker? The, no. Yeah, the restraining was in the post. <laughs> uh, listen, what I wanted to talk to you about, Connor, was uh, the parole board. Now, the parole board has been in trouble before a couple of years ago uh, it purported to try to let out of jail John Warboys the taxi rapist the government stepped in, the Justice Department uh, challenged the parole board, took it to court and they had to overturn their decision and thank God John Warboys stayed inside the guy is an inveterate rapist he would have raped again so God knows how they came to this decision in fact at the time we all said hey parole board how did you come to this decision? And they said, none of your business. We make our decisions in private. So the public get no say in this and there's no transparency. And I think that's got to end. And we have a situation now, of course, you'll have followed it. Colin Pitchfork, Pitchfork who back in the 1980s uh, murdered and raped two teenage schoolgirls separately. Uh, is now up for parole. The parole board has decided he's, come out, he's coming out of jail. Uh, Justice Secretary uh, Robert Jenrick tried to uh, challenge this, uh, uh, but failed. So uh, fairly soon, Colin Pitchfort, the double schoolgirl rapist and murderer, will be amongst us. Once again, we've been saying, so what brought you to this extraordinary conclusion that this man's fit to be among us? Not telling you. It's uh, private. It's secret. Well, there is now a big move now to change the way the parole board operates. In other words, its hearings, uh, the, so it is proposed, will no longer be in camera. They will no longer be in secret. They will be in public, like every other legal proceeding in this country. It's in the public domain. Uh, so justice not only done, but seen to be done. Uh, would you approve of such a move? Absolutely. In, in principle, there should be full transparency for our justice system because we are not only the ones footing the bill for it, that seems to be the strange compromise that we're forced to do now where quite literally the victims of crime have to pay into an indiscriminate tax pot to fund the upkeep of their perpetrators. But also it, the transparency adds a layer of accountability so that the failures repeatedly of the justice system to follow up on these parole uh, uh, terms and agreements don't fall through the net again. I mean, we've had instances, for example, where uh, sexual assault victims before have not been notified of their um, attackers being released from prison and have spotted them in places like Asda and a nightclub, etc. Uh, how that's allowed to slip through the net when they're a clear and present danger for, for committing the crime again, when there's about 50% recommittal rate, is baffling. I've heard uh, defenders of the parole board say, well, the parole board takes their role very, very seriously and they will have read all the evidence and they'll be well schooled on exactly uh, what uh, Colin Pitchfort's psychological reports say, what kind of a person he's become. You know, they do. They take they take their jobs very seriously and they have decided that he can come out and, and we're supposed to go, oh, well, that's all right then. I want to know why they've decided it. I cannot help feeling uh, about Colin Pitchfork. Uh, they're making a terrible mistake. He's 61 years old, therefore uh, still sexually active, potentially. Uh, he clearly is a psychopath. He was a psychopath when he parked his car back in the late 1980s with his baby son in the back, nipped off into the woods uh, to kill and rape uh, a, a teenage schoolgirl called Linda Mann and then went back to his car and drove home. This is the kind of guy we're talking about. Uh, psychopaths don't get cured, uh, and a lot of people fear that he could get triggered and he could make his uh, evil decisions uh, to commit crimes again. Uh, but uh, not, none of what I'm saying particularly matters that much, except that's my viewpoint. I sense you agree with me. Yeah. But I think we have the right to know what the parole board's thinking is about people like Colin Pitchfork. Yeah, and I don't think... I think the, the reason for the opaqueness is exactly as, as you've sort of hit on here. They don't have an objective reason as to why crimes of this nature warrant release, generally speaking. I mean, life no longer means life in this country. And the uh, philosophical issues surrounding the death penalty being that you can never trust that an innocent person won't have their lives taken and there's no way to repay that. That's, that means that's uh, been decreed no longer a solution. 
But then you can't explain why there isn't a category of crime that's so heinous that you can't say, okay, even though you may personally redeem in prison, in your own mind, and you may not want to commit again, we can't trust that you aren't such a problem for public safety that we can't lock you in a box and throw away the key. I think that has to go for crimes like pitchforks, murder, rape, pedophilia are in that box that, that is just away, and you cannot trust to let those sort of people out again. Particularly because you said, as a psychopath, if that's a clinical diagnosis, I'm more than willing to accept given the nature of his crimes. Um, it doesn't mean that he's insane. It means that he's so socially competent that he can manipulate his way into getting exactly. what he wants. And what he would want is to be released and to be around vulnerable people like the school children that he killed again. So you can't trust that he's not just gaming the system, trying to get out for good behavior, and then going the way that lots of criminals do and recommitting their crimes again and again and again. And non-transparency by the parole board in this fashion can cost lives. Whereas uh, full transparency, hell, live stream it for all I care. I think that would actually be a good idea. Um, that will increase public safety immeasurably while also maintaining the transparency of our judicial system. One of the arguments about Colin Pitchfork, which is very frustrating, is this, uh, that actually when he committed his crimes, when he was found guilty of his terrible crimes, uh, life didn't necessarily mean life. Uh, in, in law then, yeah. uh, there was no such thing as a genuine full life sentence. All life sentences had to potentially uh, be able to be commuted uh, and people be let out. Uh, we've since changed that. There are now offences and it is now possible for a judge to say uh, you're going to jail and you're never ever coming out. You couldn't say it in Pitchfork's day uh, and the reason he's got the chance of coming out is because of the law when he went into jail but you know if that really is going to be the defense of why this guy's going to get released, oh, the law changed, so, uh, you know, uh, we could have left him in jail, but we can't anymore. Uh, if he commits another offense, uh, there'll be a lot of people asking some serious questions. Yeah, rightly so. And I, I think it's strange that, that his lawyers clearly can make an appeal to the argument of, oh, you should be protected by it the rules when if you flip over a game board you're no longer protected by the rules and the the subjective inability to acknowledge an objective morality doesn't mean that objective morality doesn't exist therefore just because the laws were wrong way back then when we made that correction it doesn't make his crimes any less heinous than when they were committed and the life sentence that he should have got any more valid that that should have been dished out there and then so that should have been continually upheld uh, agreed. Uh, so uh, you and I both agree it's a very good idea to make the parole board more uh, transparent. That way uh, we can know what they're thinking. When they're, And I cannot help thinking, Connor, uh, that they're making a terrible mistake with this bloke, Colin Pitchfork. And certainly uh, it sounds to me like a bunch of sort of liberal Guardian reading yep. uh, officials who are telling the population, the sensible, normal population of this country, you can leave this sort of thing to us uh, because we need to protect you from your illiberal ways and uh, we need to let these people out. Well, uh, let's see what happens, shall we? Uh, let's have one more story. I think uh, we can just squeeze in, Connor. Uh, Fury as a mahogany bust from 1817 of King George III. Uh, he's depicted as a sort of Roman Empire and at his feet are two kneeling African men uh, of colour. Uh, so it's one of these kind of statues of their time, yeah. if you like. It's only a little bust. Anyway, it's been removed uh, from the National Maritime Museum uh, because it uh, includes a hurtful reinforcement of racial stereotypes. Uh, the, I mean, this is, you know, every day in every way we come across these kind of stories. Uh, but anti-woke campaigners have said this decision is absurd. My view is, you know, I can see the reservations about a bust like that, a, a statue like that. You know, there's something very colonial about it uh, and perhaps a little bit outmoded. But yep. it was made in 1817. You know, I'm a grown up. I can take it. You don't have to take it away from my very eyes. Why are they taking this out of the museum? Well, it insults our intelligence. Well, I, I agree. The question of why they're trying to do it is very different to whether or not there is any uh, legitimacy in opposing the bus. Because you're right, some of the it's a bit caricaturish, not least of all because George III was a very mad king and I don't think but he... I think yeah. I find that that's what makes it interesting. I mean, it's a little snippet of history. Yes, and funnily enough, the actual bus itself was for a yacht that was, as you said, in 1817. That's ten years after Parliament passed the declaration that permitted uh, the abolition of slavery 
from from Britain and the British Empire. Um, obviously, it took a long time to slow roll that out, not least of all because certain British colonies didn't want to give up their slaves. Think of King Giza, Giza of Benin, for example. Uh, but the other interesting thing is this was actually part of an exhibition that was on the transatlantic slave trade. So this whole time when we've been saying, oh, okay, we'll, we'll make a compromise. Let's take statues out of the public eye and either put a plaque next to them or put them in a museum to give them proper context. What was in the proper context? It was sitting in a, in a thing about the transatlantic slave trade, even though it was made for a ship that was made for Britain's naval vessel uh, uh, victories rather than actually for a slave vessel. And still there were complaints. So it just shows the actual campaigning about this, the opposition to this, isn't a principled uh, discussion about telling the truth about the British Empire and British history and that. Because when you attempt to, when we make an earnest effort to say, okay, here it is in its proper context, educate yourselves about it. They still oppose it. So it's simply about rewriting history, trying to remove the fact that, that sins and also the uh, the good parts, like the abolition of slavery when lots of other countries weren't, weren't doing so, are removed from their context and are removed from the public consciousness. And it's to create a new uh, sort of uh, ever-present, ever-progressive moral code projected onto history. Yeah, I mean, it's a censorship of history. And I find this kind of bust, this kind of statue, uh, interesting, a, a real sign of uh, those times. Uh, and why they should think that uh, taking this from uh, out of our view is important to our welfare. I mean, I don't want them to make the, these decisions. You know, I'm a sentient adult. I can make these decisions myself about whether or not I approve of that statue. It doesn't have to be censored. It doesn't have to be taken down. Uh, but this woke nonsense, uh, it's, I mean, ostensibly on the face of it, it's often very, very funny. Uh, but it's a scourge, isn't it? Absolutely. It's it's same ideology that's in line with Mao's cultural revolution. Uh, I think it's quite funny how President Trump has become a giant orange Nostradamus at this point, back when they were trying to take down in the Charlottesville rally the statues of where he said, okay, you start with someone as objectionable as a conservative general, who's next? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and then you're sticking dynamite under Mount Rushmore. It's gotten to the point now where the progressives are literally waging war on inanimate pieces of rock. And to paraphrase a Nietzsche quote, um, Anyone who makes a moral crusade out of finding enemies will find them everywhere he looks. So this will never end unless we stop it. That's how they made Mount Rushmore with dynamite. Uh, so uh, dynamite's back, this time to destroy. It's <laughs> pathetic, isn't it? Uh, Connor, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks, Connor Kevin. Tomlinson, Conservative commentator. Regular feature uh, this, uh, this Tuesday and every Tuesday. So he'll be back next week, hopefully in person again. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Talk Radio.